What's up, everybody? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. And as always, I try to bring you guys some fresh new content. And today is going to be the first time where I'll be featuring content about some sports psychology and the mental aspect of playing volleyball or really succeeding in any pressure situation. And I'm honored to have two guests on uh, today's video. The first one is Josh Prechison, who is the owner of Game Ready, and he's the one that's going to be featuring a lot of some great content from his company and how to be mentally ready for your games. And of course, you guys know my Cambodian brother, <laughs> Justin Watkin, my fun partner. Um, you guys remember him from the Dig interview back in January. So really exciting to have him back on the uh, on our our channel. And just a little backstory, you might recognize Josh's last name. Uh, you guys, some of you guys know uh, Aquaman, also known as Chris Patrison. It's actually Josh's brother. So I got connected with Josh through Chris, our opposite. And then he, he just said, hey, you might be interested in uh, meeting my brother and see what he has to talk about regarding that. So that's kind of a little backstory of how we all all met. That's so, that's funny, yeah. So I I didn't realize that you called him Aquaman. That was my that was my favorite DC character growing up, what? and I had an Aqua 1963 Ford pickup that I drove in high school, and everybody called me Aquaman. That's really funny. That's I didn't know that. So, you know, the uh, funny thing is, I actually don't call him Aquaman. I call him the Viking because you know the German descent, and he just has this raw. He's like burly arms, hairy. So I call him the Viking. <laughs> Or the, the crowbar, because I, I can ask what your last name means in German. But then all the fans call him Aquaman because he's got the, the beard and the... Oh, the yeah, um, that makes sense because of uh, the, the Aquaman. Yeah, yeah, the newest Aquaman movie. Okay. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, we're excited to be here with you and Dustin. Uh, so our company is Volleyball Mindsetter and our website is vbmindsetter.com. And the product that we feature is the Game Ready. Now a little background on me, you can see I've got a BYU volleyball shirt on. I played at BYU from 03 to 06. So I was part of our last national championship. Um, and then I went into the recruiting world and then found myself coming back into the coaching space and really got into this mindset side. Now, playing at BYU, we did have someone that came in every once in a while and did some sort of like, hey, come meditate, like a pre-game, like, hey, just meditate for a little bit, you know, relax your body. You know, there's all sorts of things out there about meditation and, and that sort of stuff. But what happened is I came across this gentleman by the name of Dave Austin. And Dave Austin had been working with Major League Baseball players for 20 years. And in that time, he helped produce four Major League Baseball MVPs. So when I met him and he told me that, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, worked with them from AAA through their MVP seasons, right? And so it's just like, wow. And he's had the opportunity to work with some other guys that he doesn't really claim. They, they ended up being MVPs as well. But, you know, he just worked with them a little bit. But these are guys that he worked with on using the game ready, which we'll talk about here today, since they were in the minor leagues. Okay. Really exciting. And obviously, I got intrigued by that. By that. Like, how are you doing that? And that's when he introduced me to the game ready. And it's this process that has some similarities from many different sciences around mental preparation and, and mental performance uh, in, in, you know, the mental sports performance side of things. But really, it's a unique sequence and formula that we use to get people in the zone and to stay there longer throughout their match. And so that's the essence behind this. It's a scientific method that helps us to just perform at a higher level, right? That's what we want. We want to perform at our best and even to pick up new things and perform those faster and at higher levels. Um, and, you know, I started off, uh, when I started doing this, uh, I, I basically just reached out to my former setter uh, from BYU who happened to be 
uh, the assistant coach for USA men's volleyball. And that's how I got introduced to Dustin and started working with Dustin. Dustin's my very first client. Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's pretty much my guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, I say the same thing. I'm, I'm the guinea pig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rob, Rob reached out to me, and uh, I, I think anyone that follows me, I'm just – very curious of how I can be a little better. Maybe it's nutrition, maybe it's stretching, weightlifting, watching video, uh, drinking mushroom tea, stitching coffee, whatever it may be. Um, so I, I visualized before. And so uh, naturally I was pretty curious. I jumped on a call with uh, Josh and uh, I was intrigued and then uh, very kindly offered his services for free. It's just like, let's try it out. You know, I'm like, okay, I'll try it out and worked with it during like kind of a, a difficult part of the summer where it was really wasn't traveling, but it was just, okay, you know, stick with the process. What can I control? And that's my preparation every day, you know, the night before practice, before practice meeting with Josh and then in practice. And so it's been a, it's been a great journey and a mentorship has turned to a friendship and, yeah, that's why I'm here today, just to talk about my experience and uh, glowingly, you know, uh, the results I've had. I think I've played, uh, I wouldn't say played, but competed and most importantly, um, present. Because there's a lot of times where you really can't control the outcome, but there's a lot of work we can do to being in that moment and being able to, to be tough, resilient, and gritty when things externally aren't going as you had hoped. And so throughout the summer and uh, especially during this year, being back in the Polish League, I think I've done a really good job in these, uh, these moments where things aren't going well or just kind of continuing the steady, steady flow of just being present when things are going good and just continue, 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 continue. Yeah, and, and before we go too deep into like some of the successes you've had, because I think you've had a lot of successes using this, let me just kind of – bring it in a little tighter. You know, I talked about it very, um, you know, vaguely, but let me, let me tell you what the game ready process is. So the game ready is a visualization process and it's part of some of the, the science that, you know, many, many different psychologists out there talk about. Um, and, and you've probably heard about some of these concepts, but we use the idea of being in the zone, right? Which, which in psychology they call the flow state. And so what are we trying to do? We're trying to create a process to get you into a flow state where things just happen in much more flow. They happen more easily, more effortlessly at a higher level. And so we have a couple of components to do that. We, overall, it's a visualization technique, okay? But before we get into the visualization, we use subconscious priming. Uh, now, what is subconscious priming? Uh, subconscious priming, well, you know, priming, when you prime anything, you're prepping it, right? You're getting it ready. And so what we do with the subconscious priming is we help you set what we call intentions. In other words, what are the things that we're gonna help you visualize doing so that it primes you mentally to feel like you've already done it right before you go do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one of the first keys. And, and what this gets people doing is, you know, a lot of us go into the match and we're like, I wanna win the match I want to be dominant. I want to get all these kills. Like I want to make all these digs, like whatever position we're at. And I've seen over the years, guys step off the court at the pro level, at the collegiate level, at the club level, youth level, guys coming off the court that are just beasts and going, man, I suck. And you're like, what the heck? You know, like, how does that even happen? You know, I remember, this is a great story, Russell Holmes. I actually made the, the BYU volleyball team walking on and playing against Russell Holmes, who, of course, competed in the 2008 Olympics uh, right before you were there, right, Dustin? Like, that was, you were still in college at that time? 
I think it was 2012. Oh, you're right. You're right. It was 2012. But yeah, no, Russ, Russ and I are pretty good friends. I really got along from when I was on the team. Yeah, perfect. So he competed in the 2012 uh, London Olympics when we won bronze. And I had to compete against him to make the team. <laughs> I'm, I'm a 6'2 guy, and I'm playing middle blocker to make the team at the number one team in the country at the time, right? And I remember I was doing pretty decent, but I remember one day after practice, this was a huge win. I was like, hey, Russ, do you mind sticking around after practice today and, and help let me get some reps in just going against your block? And he's all, why, dude? You'll just hit over me every time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm like, there's a claim to fame, the great Russell Holmes. But you see, like, it doesn't matter how great people are. We have these kind of moments where we define ourselves by our outcomes. And what this subconscious priming does is get you immediately not focused on the outcomes and focused on the very specific actions that you can take during the match. And it's, it's focusing on that process. There's a brilliant behavioral psychologist out there named Joseph Grenny. And in his book, Influencer, he says, the greatest performers focus on behaviors or processes rather than outcomes. Absolutely. And so that's the first, the first uh, part, right? Dustin, do you, want, do you want to chime in there? Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. I was actually thinking of, like the, thinking of gratitude. But yeah, the intentions are big because kind of has you go outside your bubble, just kind of like, well, I hope everything's going to go well. And just kind of being a slave to maybe the first couple actions or the first set. Because for a lot of guys, if it doesn't go well, you, I mean, you just go out and you just kind of like, will yourself maybe prepared pretty well but it's just like all right like here i go i'm just gonna put my will into it rather than uh setting the intentions and maybe being honest with yourself like a couple times you know i know these big servers and just stay stay steady you know i don't need to be perfect i know i'm gonna get some aces but that's okay and so setting the intentions i think it it's huge because not only do you go in with a game plan but you're slowly already manifesting what's going to happen internally and therefore it happens externally. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so this is something, let me just give you a few things, Donnie. So uh, that your viewers can really put something into use from this, what we're talking about. And, and so an example of intentions, it can be something as vague as just stay positive. Right. That's that's something you can control. It's an action. Just staying positive. It's how you think in your mind. It's the words you say. It's not getting negative. OK, it can be that vague, I guess, or it can be very, very specific. For example, another player I was working with was in a Euro Cup game, which is different from his uh, French season match. And they had to switch balls in the Euro Cup they use the Mikasa instead mm -hmm. of the Molten. Mm -hmm. So switching over to the Molten, he had a very specific, specific intentions from how to handle, you know, specifically how to pull back a little bit more because the Mikasa has more pop to it. So we focused on really just creating more space with his, with his uh, passing platform so that he could pull back a little bit more. And I know Dustin talks about this all the time, creating that space, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but very specifically, I don't know if you've ever had that experience, Dustin, with those oh, Mikasa it's balls. So mental, it's so mental switching balls. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I like to think I do a pretty good job preparing myself with my mindset. But when you switch the balls, like everything's like, oh no, like <laughs> you, you start going to worst case scenario, like uh, I'm going to lose my contract, you know, but yeah, this you know, can be kind of tough. And so that was actually pretty good foresight by whoever that was. Yeah. And so literally he told me that the first two days of practice with the Mikasa ball, he was shaking everything. And then we did the game ready before his Euro Cup match. And he said, dude, it was awesome. I didn't shake any balls. I didn't have a single shank. 
<laughs> so it was really cool. It was really cool because of that specific intention. So that's the whole thing around intentions. Dustin, do you just want to maybe give, you know, uh, some of the, the followers, some of the intentions that you really focus on? Yeah, I think a lot of it comes to being aggressive and confident and then uh, hitting that respa breath. Because in the Polish league, it's I'm on a team that we could fight for – maybe fifth place, we can also get maybe 11th place. And so every week, it's, it's not like there's an easy match. Every week, it's a big match. And so with that, you play big servers and maybe even if you're playing a great game, you're passing 50% positive, not perfect positive. So it's just coming back time and time again and just being as present as possible and having that confident, aggressive mindset where it's like, I'm going to go hard and see every time. Like, I'm going to be okay with a bad pass because I'm going to come right back rather than letting the external environment dictate how you feel. And maybe it's uh, anxiety, insecurity, or worse, shame. So it's just constantly kind of reframing and then having something to come back to, which I'm sure we can, we'll get to later. For you as a libero, uh, what does that look like specifically for you to be aggressive? Is that something general for a position like i'm just gonna hog this seam or is that aggression specific to you saying like i am gonna take a huge first step every single time <laughs> i mean a lot of times in the polish league you don't even get a step <laughs> uh, but uh yeah i mean it's it's rather than having like uh like the ambiguity about the seams just always going like for example yeah. Usually if a player is serving in area one, it's like left seams, right? Player serving in area five, it's right seams. But I also like to dictate in front and behind. And because there's going to be servers that not only can hit it like right in the middle consistently, but maybe they have like some side spin. So it's going off one guy's shoulder into the seam. So the guy's like, the guy that's going off the shoulder, he's like, all right, it's going away from me. And the other guy's like, well, it's on this guy. And so for me, especially in a jump serve, I always like to go behind. No matter where I am, I just go behind because if it's easy, then the outsider can pick it off and he can get some confidence passing. That confidence will translate to hitting. And no matter what, there's no ambiguity on my part. If the outside hitter doesn't want it, I'm going every time hard behind and I can fall. So I can go and take that step or just lunge and fall and I can commit to it every time. If he takes it, great. I can fall back and nothing happens. I don't need to get up and hit a pipe. And if he doesn't take it, I'm tracking it the whole way and just going. And so leaving no ambiguity and just going every time. If it's a short serve, getting that first good step going forward. And then same thing on a float serve. I want my outside hitters, if they feel good and it's an easy serve, I want them to eat it up because that will transfer to their attacking confidence. So it's the easy balls, they can go in front and get, but I'm going to go behind just in case they're not feeling good or they kind of back out. And so I'm always there. And then on defense too, it's, it's a big deal mindset where it's like someone hits a ball or someone hits a ball. There's like that millisecond where you're like, mm, maybe someone else's, or it's just like, I'm going. And so it's like that same thought every time on defense, on covering, on setting a ball. Because a lot of times with setting, maybe liberals and outsides or opposites and middles can relate. There's that like second where the ball comes and you're like, mm, I don't want to set it. And like that thought just like destroys you because now you start manifesting a bad set even before it happens. So it's like that ball comes and you're like, great, it's mine. And just trying to make that switch every time. See, mine, tip, mine. I'm going, I get it. I get to have this opportunity to go get the ball rather than like, oh no, this opportunity is for me to mess up. Wow, so, dude. Those are like, gems, dude. Those are serious yeah. gems right there for liberos. <laughs> Any liberos listening? Oh okay. man. You know, what I think was so, what was great about the insight is the reps when you're not touching the ball. And that's what creates that pattern of aggression. Cause like you said, like when you, when you ha give yourself a moment to decide the ball's already gone, but more importantly, you're not creating the habit. You're creating a habit of making a decision, but it can't be a decision. It has to be a habit. So I think what was great about that is even when I'm not passing, I am moving like I'm passing. So if they don't pass, I'm still there. If they do pass, great, but you're just there. That was great. Yeah, yeah. And you're just kind of like, you know, wiring the, the neurons where it's just like you see the ball, you go. And so there's actually one time, one year, 
and maybe I, I can do this again. I think I'd still benefit from it. One year in Finland, where after practice, I would run lines. And I'm sure my teammates were like, why is this guy running lines? But I would count, I would keep tallying my head. Every ball I didn't go for would be a set of like six lines. Uh-huh. And for me, I'm like slow. I hate running. I hate conditioning. And so this was like the worst thing that could happen. And so for me, in practice, there was that intention where it's like, I'm going for every ball. It doesn't matter if it's like a foot in front of me or 20 feet and hitting the wall. I'm just like going. So like wiring in in my brain, that first step, I see the ball, I go. I see the ball, I go. I see the ball, I go. And if not, I had those line trips. And then, you know, I wanted to, I didn't want to run. And so I started, you know, fixing it mentally. And then again, I had this great first step where I never felt I was a great defensive player, but. I just kind of had this grit where it's just like, I'm just going to beat the ball to the floor. It's not I'm a great defensive player. It's I'm going to beat the ball to the floor. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so, and, and you know, bringing that back to what your original question, Donnie, was for, for Dustin is, you know, what does that aggression look like? What's cool about the game ready process and, and every uh, aspect of it, starting with intentions, is that so much of the context doesn't need to be there for this to work. Like the context can be all up here inside your own head. Like I had never known about all those different things that Dustin just explained until I started watching him explaining it on his feed. But I didn't know like that's how he thought about those things. But he knew he was going through these in his mind, right? Even with something like the word aggression, I'm gonna be more aggressive in this match. That's my intention. And I'll tell you, one of the big things that Dustin brought up was shame. And this is something that I deal with so much with players at any level. And we work with youth all the way up to the professional level, is that so many people expect you to perform at certain levels, including yourself. And so there's this shame that comes around, uh, you know, around your performance and the outcomes of your performance. And one of the greatest intentions, I love this. This is a great intention for anyone out there to help you just play at your best level is just to be free to be yourself. Like just that trust and love to be you. You know, I helped, you know, I, I actually uh, worked with this, this uh, youth player at the high school level and we focused on this intention before state championships now they lost the match but she and their other hitter their top hitter on their team were the only two girls that just played like with confidence and freedom and carried it throughout the match and we'll get i want to i want to go we're going to go back to that story remind me to come back to that story when we talk about triggers because that's really important so we're uh but but that just that intention and she creates the context in her own head, right? Of what that means to her and and the specific feelings and internal talk that she tells herself. Now, of course, you know, we can give, you know, guidance in that as well. You know, it it is something when you hear Dustin tell you, you've got, you know, a, a great first step as a libero, right? Or if you say, hey, this guy was part of a, you know, national championship program, at BYU and played at this high level. And I've, I've, you know, maybe I'm a peer or maybe I've never been to that level. Who knows? But, but you, you hear someone that you admire and they're telling you great things about yourself. I can tell you my youth players, when I'm talking, they're like, they're just <laughs> listening so intently. And so when I tell them like, man, just trust that you do, you do that at such a high level. They're like, really? You know, and they really take it in, especially at the youth level. Um, I really love that. So that's intentions. That's the the first piece. Now, the second piece to this is gratitude. And and Dustin brought that up. Wow. Dustin, do you want to go? I'm going to let you uh, talk about gratitude a little bit because I know you've been studying gratitude for years. and It's been a big part of your game. I mean, being in the pool, like I said, being in the Polish thing, like every game is kind of like a do or die because the points are uh, so interchangeable and it makes such a big difference. And so every game there's like, and it's great. There's like this, I was talking with um, a German guy yesterday. He plays like on my neighboring team and we both play in the German league last year. He was on Friedershof and I was in Berlin. He's like, man, Berlin, it just, 
sucked. Like there's this, you don't have this feeling in your chest, like this, what's going to happen, this adrenaline, you know, this cortisol pumping, like, and so you have this and it feels great, but at the same time, you know, you can be just destroyed or it's just like, you start thinking of like all the worst case scenarios. But uh, what I really know is connecting with Josh before the game is you get in this gratitude and there's two ways for me to do this. One, it's being in nature. I have like kind of like woods by me and being in nature kind of helps calm the two, but talking about like, like what you already have in your life, because a lot of times it's like, not necessarily like my glass is half empty or my glass is half full. It's like, I have a glass. And so rarely we, uh, we make note of this. And so when we talk about gratitude, it's like, you know, I think for what I already have before the game, rather than I need to win to feel good. I need to play well to feel good. I need to pass a certain number as liberals are always like counting the passing. And so just taking stock of like what you already have. So for me, it's like, another day with my friends, another day getting to do what I love, another day, what I like to say is testing my level against great players to learn from. Because maybe I go into the game, I want to play great against great players. I can't control this, but I get to test my level against great players and I get to take abundance in that. And so the thing is, when I, what I feel when I talk about gratitude and abundance, I just feel like goosebumps. I'm just like, yeah. I am enough. I am whole. I have so much in my life already. And then it just kind of propels me off. And I'm just like in space. And it's just like, you know what, whatever happens, it happens. But I'm in a place, I'm in a foundation of elevated emotional state of joy, of trust, of abundance, of gratitude. And I just get to do what I love without the fear of or maybe the attachment of something outside of me that I can't control that will make me happy. That will make me complete. And so that's my favorite part about it. Cool. Yeah. And I like, I love hearing this cause we haven't talked about this. Like what, you know, like what you love about that. We just kind of do it. We gauge the results and we, we adjust. Right. So <laughs> well, like, last game, like we always try to time it because we leave on the bus for away games. And I usually do the game ready, like on the bench. And last game, I was like hitting a tap and a tap and a tap. And it was like, finally, like, Dustin, we, we speak in the locker room. And I'm like, all right. So I was like walking, like we were like finishing up. <laughs> usually it's just like we connect and then that's it. Yeah, that's so. funny, man. But yeah, so the, the gratitude piece is huge. Again, it's the intentions and the gratitude are such a part of priming our thoughts and priming our emotions. Mm -hmm. so that it's not being dictated. Our value, our worth is not being dictated by the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that is huge. Like it just, and, and like I said, and Dustin, I know you've seen it. Donnie, I know you've seen it traveling around the world. Like guys get in their own heads, even the best guys, because they make a mistake. We're usually harder on ourselves than we are anybody else. Yeah, I think again, it's just putting too much stock in the outcomes. And it, if this happens, I'll feel this way. If this happens, I'll feel another way. And it's actually, uh, it's kind of going to rant, but I think why I'm so successful is my parents um, always, whether it was intentional or not, were growth mindset. And it wasn't like, uh, we're proud of you because you won. It was like, we're proud of you on the way you competed and win or lose they didn't have a different reaction whereas parents may think they're doing a great thing by celebrating the wins but when you celebrate the wins and you're not celebrating the losses now the athlete is associating himself and his value and his worth if i win my parents love me if i lose silence and so now where a lot of people you know there's this uh, attachment to the outcomes and uh, a sense of value, a sense of worth. Whereas this, it's like, you know, I'm already full. I'm already full of abundance. And then whatever happens, happens. But, you know, right now I'm just focused on the growth. It reminds me of uh, John Wooden. And, you know, reading his books and people who knew him always talked about, he never talked about winning, even though he was like the winningest coach of all time for championships. And he, he just seems to be, ahead of the curve in terms of embracing this mindset and it makes sense because like hearing Dustin talk and then uh, Josh you explain your your 
I guess, philosophy or the science behind it, that being in a, a, in a place where you can walk away, I mean, it sounds generic, right? Knowing that you did your best and you can be proud of the work you've put in regards to the results. I think that's the, the hardest mindset to train. So I coach at a, a high school where ac- academic performance is, is so highly prized. I mean, we're one of the, the top performing schools uh, in the nation, actually, where you know kids are taking tons of AP and honors classes. People are trying to get into Stanford, Berkeley, Brown University. And so your self-worth often is tied to how well you do in school, and that kind of bleeds over. Like the benefit is that we get kids that want to want to listen and want to work hard, but we also get a population where they're very risk averse, right? Because they're chasing these big universities because they want to get that safe job, doctor, lawyer, engineer. I've been struggling to teach them how to dissociate performance, even on that one pass, right? That will dictate their self worth. Therefore, I'm not a good volleyball player. And then that leads to not trying as hard because what's the point of trying if I'm not going to get it because I'm not going to get it because I don't think I'm good and look at what happened last night. It's just that endless cycle. So um, I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts on how you would, you know, teach somebody how to dissociate that. Yeah, that's actually a great question. And, the, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day and, and the, the one thing I think this is really important because one of the things that most people in life measure themselves by is how much money they make, right? So many people get obsessed with like, hey, success is determined by if I'm making money or not, right? And so what I think is great, though, is the people who generate the most money in the world, the stock market, right? People on the stock market. One of the biggest mantras on the stock market is past performance does not determine future earnings. It's a huge statement you'll hear everywhere in the highest money making machine in the world, the US stock exchange, (laughs) right? So literally they're saying the past doesn't matter. And so we have this one technique that I love called taking out the trash. And so if you picture yourself, you're playing and picture yourself with a trash can, a garbage can attached to your hip. Dustin, could you imagine yourself out there playing with a trash can on your hip? Now see yourself have a negative thought because someone laughed when you made an error or you had a negative self-talk like I suck, man, or, you know, whatever. Just see trash just getting in there. And the more you talk and the more you mess up, the more it just keeps piling up. And guess what happens? You're going slower. You're thinking slower. You're moving slower. You get so bogged down. Grab the freaking trash can and toss it. It's great to do in front of people. You just toss the, a trash can full of garbage in front of everybody. <laughs> and just empty the trash can. Let it go. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of thoughts. It's a, uh, it's definitely a slippery slope when we're so attached to the outcome because we don't re- reach the outcome, then we inflict suffering on ourselves. You know, there's like a saying of like two arrows, and so maybe like you fail, you fail, and this is the first arrow, and then the second arrow is self-infliction. I'm not good, or you can go even further with, I'm not good, guilt, or or I did bad, guilt and I am bad shame. And so it's, it can be a very slippery slope. And then inside the moment, it's just how present can I be? Because the, the next ball is the most important ball. And so how present can I be? It's like, all right, shake it off. Maybe I can't come back with hundred percent focus, clarity and confidence, but can I come back with 95, 90 rather than just wearing it all over my face? You see these faces, they're just like, you know, they're just, they're caught in the failures of the past or the anxiety of the future. And so that's, that's kind of the trick is doing the preparation, knowing that these moments will come and how we embrace them and how we will be able to regain as much clarity, focus, and confidence as possible to get to the next ball after failing. Is it a progression or is, are they just equally facet, equal facets that you just focus on all at the same time? 
Yeah, there's there's some overlap in it all for sure. Um, but what we do is we focus on those two pieces, the intentions and the gratitude. And now we're going to go into the visualization process. So we take you into this visualization process where now we incorporate those. That's, that's why they become subconscious priming. And now we enter the, um, you, you know, this, this science of neuroplasticity where literally we start thinking and visualizing things happening and that creates a result. I mean, there's multiple studies that you can find out there of people practicing you know, shooting free throws in their mind and improving just as well as those who went out and practice physically. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of, uh, it's funny because working with you at the same time I started reading this uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza books I've been reading is You Are the Placebo and Becoming Supernatural. And same thing, you know, um, there's a study with uh, people practicing the piano and people visualizing practicing the piano. And it's, uh, you know, almost the same results. And so it's fascinating. It's beyond fascinating. And that's why, again, I was attracted to it because it's just another edge. You can mentally rehearse. And when I first got to visualization, there was a book called 10 Minute Toughness. And it talks about how, how much time skiers put into visualization because they know the course and it differs from like a second. And so they just constantly are skiing the course with their minds because they can only do it so much a day. And especially when people are injured and when they're injured, the people that invested it more actually come back skiing faster. So it's absolutely fascinating for me. You know, it, it's great for anyone. Now, Dustin, obviously, you know, playing libero, it's not a high impact. It's easier to get reps, but especially like hitters, middle blockers, outside hitters, oppos, like, I mean, you can't just be going out there and, you know, taking extra reps. It's just wearing and tearing on your body. I mean, after I was done playing, I think I slept on my left shoulder at night for like five years until, <laughs> until my right shoulder felt normal again, you know? And it's just, it's wear and tear on your body. So to be able to get extra reps through that, I mean, it's just, it's huge, it's huge in creating actual physical new uh, patterns inside your brain that tell you you can do this, that this is possible, and this is how to do it. And so it becomes really powerful. Now take it into the context of us doing it right before your match and incorporating all these other powerful thoughts. The intentions are really your thoughts and then gratitude is more your, you know, your feelings. So you're we were bringing this high powered energy from your thoughts and from, and from your feelings and interjecting it into this visualization. And, oh man, it just becomes so powerful. Um, you know, Dustin will tell you, I see all the time he posts, like, I love the energy Josh brings. Even the energy I'm bringing through my gratitude and through my visualization, walking my athletes through it comes through. It really becomes a powerful way as I guide them through the visualization process. And it's a little bit of a combination. I do some of the filling in of the details. They do some of the filling in of the details of that visualization. Do you do the visualizations with your eyes closed? Do you lay down, sit up, or is it a conversation you guys have with each other? I'll usually do it. Um, yeah, we have a conversation. I'll, I'll sit. I'll usually go on the bench or maybe uh, a seat in the crowd because no one's there yet. And I'll just close my eyes and as if I'm meditating. Yeah. And so it's essentially it's more of like, think about it this way. Think of it more like, you know, have you ever listened to one of those like meditation type uh, recordings and you just listen to their voice and they, you know, it, 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 you see it all the time on stage with hip, hypnotists, right? <laughs> so it's like, listen to my voice, right? So to some degree, it's a little bit of that, like me guiding you, but I give you chances to, to uh, interject at certain points to let me know you're ready to go on to the next step, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so for the most part, I'm doing the guiding and you just close your eyes and listen and visualize. Now, everybody's different. I'm amazed. I remember the first time we ever did a game ready, Dustin and I, I'm pretty sure he was on the bus with USA Volleyball and I can hear the guys all just laughing and just <laughs> telling jokes and other guys are listening to music and Dustin's like, yeah, I'm ready. And I'm like, are you sure you're ready? <laughs> <laughs> Most people like need to go find like this quiet space. They don't want anyone looking at them. They don't want anyone to think they're weird. Like Dustin, Dustin's just like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. I can find my Zen like right here. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm well past that. That stays on the national team. It's been accepted that I'm different for a while. Now, so. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I have another client who's, who's been in the USA gym uh, and, and, and uh, was like, whoa, that Dustin guy, like, He's a meditator. Like you'll just randomly find him meditating somewhere, and you're like, "Okay." <laughs> it's true. Yeah, don't don't get concerned until he starts levitating randomly. Then, then you should be concerned. <laughs> I haven't got there yet, but soon. We're get we're getting close, hey? Right. Well, and that's a perfect segue actually into the next component, which is triggers. So all the things you we've talked about so far every single time and I, I know it seems crazy it is crazy when you start doing this and you see the results i don't care if it's some young kid an amateur adult or a pro like dustin just immediately they feel like an extra energy and an extra heightened awareness when they start the match but the key is what happens then when the coach yells at you or you have a, a negative play and you start getting down on yourself. And that's why I, I told you we'd come back to that other story with that, that high school girl. So we'll, we'll jump into that right here, but this is where we get into triggers. And this is one of the things that makes the game ready one of the most amazing tools because you know Dustin's talked about um, Joe Dispenza you know I've talked about Joseph Grenny there's so many amazing people out there in the sports world um, that are doing great mind work what the game ready does is it can layer over the top of any of that that you already have and it makes it more actionable, more accessible in the moment to perform at higher levels. And one of the main ways we do that is through the triggers. So what happens is, for example, well, let me, let me give you triggers. Usually when we think of triggers, we think of it like people who are trying to you know, get off addictions, right? And you go, oh, they got triggered and now they fell back into addiction. It's, it's the most common use of the word trigger in our society. So, but that's on the negative side. The other way to trigger is trigger towards the positive. It's just something that, boom, gets you like almost like a, addicts will tell you like they almost feel like in a trance. Someone who's addicted to crack cocaine or pornography. It's like as soon as it hits, it's like a trance that they go into. It's the same way on the positive side. And when you can trigger yourself back into these things, boom, and out of all those negative emotions that we talked about, the guilt, the shame, all these things, it just changes and allows you to stay in the zone longer. I mean, that's why in the NBA, you always see them call timeouts, you know, when Steph Curry goes off, yeah, you know, every coach is calling a timeout once he hits three or four in a row. Right? The whole point is to try to get him out of the zone. Well, you know, this one particular player had her coach actually yell at her. She was playing amazing. Every parent in the stands was turning around and saying something to her mom. Like, wow, where did this come from? Who's this girl? And then the coach yelled at her and boom, error, 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 error. She came off the court after that match. This is at state, you know, state championships. And she was just like, Josh, man, like, I sucked, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, 
you were playing awesome. Didn't you feel great? Weren't you doing well? She's like, yeah. Your coach yelled at you. And that was when everything changed. What happened? And so we talked about what she was feeling. And she, we talked about, you know, the, the shame, you know, all these things, living up to other people's expectations. I've got to be perfect. And that's where, you know, we went into the triggers. And one of the triggers we use and the trigger that helped her in this case was what we call, we call them the beast triggers. And they're actual animals that we use to personify the intentions and the game ready process for you while we're going through that game, pro, game ready process. Actually visualizing yourself as that beast. And so for her, it was the bald eagle. And I know Dustin loves the bald eagle too. Maybe there's some similarities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, let me interject uh, before you go off. I know you got some great stuff, but yeah, I like to think of this as like, uh, kind of like the old school Mario, where it's like, maybe you're like the baby Mario, and if you get hit one more time, you die, but you find like a mushroom. And that's kind of like the trigger, where it's like you get knocked down, but it's like, I have this mushroom to like kind of come back. And so uh, this last game we played, uh, I just had like a really good game the game before. And then this last game, played against one of the best servers in the league. And our scouting report was like the step left on him. And so I was in area one, he cut it back, aced me. And then I got aced in the seam, even though it was kind of like the other guy's ball. And then I got aced again. So I was like already three aces in one set. I was just like, come on, man. But it's just like, Okay, back to the trigger, which was the respo. So I was like, all right, I'm back. You know, I'm normal sized again. And it's just like, how can we, how can we empower ourselves? There's different ways. Triggers is a great way to come back to that present moment. You know, let, let the past go. Let the failures of the past go. Let the anxiety, insecurities of the future that may await us and find ourselves in the present moment in whatever way and so with the animals too i like it because i was explaining to a teammate it's like you know what maybe sometimes you don't feel confident you don't feel aggressive you don't feel um like you can have this grittiness but with the animal you just picture yourself as the animal and by turn you take these qualities you absorb these qualities that these animals have and so it's like a way of kind of hacking like our uh our self like <laughs> Um, what's the word like uh, imposter syndrome like hacking our imposter syndrome where it's like taking the form of this animal it's like I can't be confident but it's like or aggressive but like with a lion it's like oh but a lion's aggressive and so you just kind of picture yourself as the lion like I'm gonna go like I'm that lion and so it's a, it's a fun way of just kind of like hacking the mind and just coming back and then again capturing these characteristics that are going to help you get that next point clarity confidence um, aggressive and so it's a fun way of bringing yourself out of your mind which you know like what is it 70 80 percent of your thoughts are negative reoccurring negative thoughts so it's a way to get out of your mind and to be more clear and what you need to get done to help your team get the next point so to activate these triggers are they physical gestures are they thoughts that like when i start to feel like oh shoot i suck oh that's when i have to think this or that's when i i don't know pick my ear on whatever yeah. the, trigger might, how the trigger might be. <laughs> yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. What are these triggers? So to finish up, you know, on what Dustin was saying, and, and then I'll go into, to your question is animals are instinctual. Animals aren't missing a meal and going, Oh man, you know, the lion's not like going, oh, I suck. Like, <laughs> it's just like, where do I find my next meal? Where do I get it? Okay, I know I'm going to go to that water hole, you know, or lions are amazing at positioning themselves in a perfect spot where they know that their prey is going to be traveling through. And they specifically map out territory. So we literally like go over some of these details about the attributes of these animals so that when you do your visualization, you feel like you embody those and it becomes more instinctual, more internal, tapping into that habitual 
process of not having to think, oh, I need to take a step here, but it becomes habit. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. You know, I, I preach about this book, The Inner Game of Tennis, where it's like self one, self two, self one. It's like the, the thinking mind where it's like, okay, step, get my arm back, bend my knees, finish my platform. But when you do this, now you're constricting yourself. You're getting tense where like the self two, this instinctual subconscious knowing where you can just play and play freely. This is where you see players like uh, Ningnapath. Like, you know, he's not thinking, he's just going here. You know, I saw him cover a ball the other day where he just put his arm back like this and covered the ball. It's just like, come on, man. And so these players, they just play with no mind. Whereas a lot of people can be very intellectual, but this gets them in trouble because now they're thinking, now they're constricting. And so I like this thought or, you know, these different animals where it's just kind of like snaps you back and away from the thinking mind, which gets us in so much trouble. Yeah. And so to answer your question, then we, we typically use three different things to help trigger us and every athlete's different and what they like as their trigger. Each person's different. <clears throat> so first of all, we use an animal. And many times I like to create not just the visual of, hey, I see the animal, but trying to associate it somehow with its name, which is the second trigger. So we'll have, <clears throat> we'll have the animal, for example, we talked about the lion. All right, so, so we have this visual in our minds of what a lion looks like, right? Most people do. Now associate it with a name that stands for something. So in this case, the lion is core, C-O-U-R, and it stands for courage. And so what I like to do is bring that into an association with some sort of action that ties it more to you. So I like having people look down at the core of their stomach and seeing that lion just jump out, just leaping out. You've got the beast of the lion inside of you. Okay, so that's the first, is like this visualization of seeing yourself as the lion embodying it or associating it with your body somehow. The second, and I'm like, some people are like, that's kind of weird for some people, right? So not everybody I coach is like into that, they love that. Some people are like, Okay, but I love core. I love courage. I love having that acronym to just bring my mind back to it. Dustin mentioned RESPA. RESPA kind of sounds like respiration, right? It's, it's, it has to deal with your breath and your breathing and resetting your mind and empowering yourself. The breath is amazing. The, our, the, our breath is like our natural stress and pain coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it uh, triggers your parasympathetic nervous system to send all these endorphins to calm you down and, and, and all these things, right? So, so RESPA is what we use to really delve into that principle. So RESPA, CORE, these are acronyms we use. So that's the second thing. You can use that in the middle of a match, RESPA. You know, with baseball players, we use RESPA for like, hey, the second that pitch is coming to you, Respa, like while it's in the air, and that's like that, right? So same thing as volleyball players. You know, we can see that we can respa in the middle of a hitter hitting or a serve. So you, so you do you, you say the word or you think it? You just have to take that breath. breath. Boom, okay. and that actually becomes the third thing so we mentioned respa but respa itself is one of the overarching principles of all the triggers and it's tapping into our breath so just to clarify the animal that visual and then the acronym and then finally our breath which we refer to as a respa breath and that in and of itself has its own animal and everything, but usually I don't go into that. Um, you know, uh, Dustin learned about RESPA, like the in-depth, you know, what animal was it associated with and all those things. Well, after he heard me say RESPA and said, use RESPA as a trigger, right? Use your breath as a trigger, right, Dustin? And I drew it on my shoe <laughs> as a nice reminder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, and you know, you see, even, even my clients will take, 
triggers and they'll move him into other areas like Dustin I had never heard you know for the eagle when he's used the bald eagle he's envisioned himself just like flying over the court and then landing back down and just boom it's a reset you know mm -hmm. And it's just everybody's different. They can they can use their own visuals to trigger this. And in this case, he put Respa on his shoe, you know, so he can look down and see on his toes. It says Respa to remind himself and to trigger himself back into this this subconscious excellence, this flow state, this being in the zone. Yeah, I mean, in going to the zone, uh, one of my favorite authors talking about this is George Mumford, who kind of was the, the mindfulness Zen guy with the Phil Jackson championship teams, the Bulls and the Lakers. And he talks about like, there really isn't a way to get into the zone, but it's, you have to do the preparation. And then it's just being in a stressful competitive environment where, you know, it's like, maybe I will win. Maybe I won't, maybe I'll succeed. Maybe I'll fail being this environment and then being able to be present with the breath. And so if you're not able to do these three things, then you're not going to find the zone. But there isn't a way to really access the zone. But you have these three things, you're more likely to access the zone. Yeah, it's nothing's guaranteed with all of this. I mean, I, every single person I've coached has seen their por performance improve. I have seen that. But it's not guaranteed that it's going to be perfect. It's not guaranteed that you're going to fall out of the, the you know, you, that you're going to stay in the zone and stay there the whole time. Like it's, it's nothing guaranteed, but we're positioning yourself. We're adding all the elements to increase the probability of you getting in the zone and staying in there longer. I love that. Absolutely. And I, I think, I think it almost is guaranteed because you have the, you have the toolbox, like you said, with this uh, female athlete, the coach is yelling. It's like, you can't control the score. You can't control your teammates. You can't control if you win or lose, someone yelling at you, your parents, or maybe even how you're playing, but you can control how you react to the external circumstances, external stimuli. And if you're doing this consistently, you're going to consistently be at a better mindset. And you're going to consistently be able to perform at a better level. And so yeah. that's kind of been the thing that I've noticed for myself because we, we were first introduced in the summer and I was kind of like, mm, kind of just some discernment. I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, I think I'm okay. But I was like, all right, hey, I'll meet with you every day before training. And for World Cup, you know, I really wanted to make the roster. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. And it was, uh, it was a big difference. And I think especially with the national team, there's always this fear of like someone's taking your job or this scarcity, or it's like, it's just, you're only, can, you can only fail. And I was just, so present, so confident. And I thought I competed the best I ever have at uh, defensively because that was kind of my purpose this summer to be possibly a defensive libero. Um, I just, I don't know. It was just so clear, uh, stepping on the court, knowing my intentions, knowing how I would reset, and just the mindset, ball, every single ball. And so I, have, I think it almost is guaranteed because you have that mental toolbox and physically you can't guarantee what you're going to do, but you have that mental toolbox. And again, you're coming back, you know, how you start the match with confidence and clarity. And eventually, you know, things are going to happen and it's going to drop a little bit, but with that toolbox or with mindful meditation, whatever it may be, you can stay up there a little bit longer while other people who don't do that work, who don't do the preparation, it's going to drop. You see great players. I mean, there's been a lot of great players on the national team that come in their first year and they're starting. And then two years they're off the team. What happened? You know, they didn't do the work. They didn't do the mental work. They didn't prepare. They didn't have the toolbox for when things got bad, for when the outcomes didn't work out to how they would like, and they weren't able to deal with it in a beneficial way. You know, adding on to the, the animal when you guys are talking about um i guess personifying yourself through an animal to that's something my, my wife talks about so she played basketball in stockton and in california stockton is pretty ghetto yeah. no, no offense to stockton i mean i actually really like the city but it's pretty good so you know and she's white so she's she's a minority in the in and um in a city where they love basketball it's really aggressive like fights after every other game type of thing and at that time, she's like 5'8", 
maybe 100 pounds, 110. And she has to play center because her school has um, just, it's not a very tall school. Um, so she would always talk about how she would envision herself something like a lion, like just this ferocity. She'd steal the ball. She would say, I've, I've envisioned like the ball being a raw piece of meat or a hundred dollar bill. And I just like ravenously going for it. It didn't matter who the other people were. And then for myself, when I played, like I, I'm, an unders- I'm only 5'10", an undersized hitter. And I remember playing when I was in college. My animal, I didn't realize I did this, but looking back, I realized it was a pretty conscious process. My animal was Jiba. <laughs> Yeah. So I would Jiba, pretend, the great you know and great. I was yeah the, the the legend and I just I just love watching him play everyone does but just his fire he just great technique great ambition great teammate and I remember every game I would just pretend like I was Jiba and then whenever I had tough moments I was like what would Jiba do I'm just gonna pretend like I'm him and I'll just go for it that that really helped keep my mind steady when I was playing I love that. We need a shirt. What would Jiba do? <laughs> exactly. That's actually a really good idea. <laughs> right? They had a – like we had a play at BYU that we called Jiba. Donnie's thinking about it. Donnie's going to make shirts. <laughs> Let's do it. You know how the Christians, they had the WWJD? That's WWGD. <laughs> oh, man. That would be so great. Well, what Let's was the, the Jiba play? It was like just an incredible. Oh, I can't thing. tell you because they still use it. Ah, uh, it's got to be his. <laughs> oh, it's got to be his one-two combo. He's got a pretty nasty, pretty <laughs> nasty one-two combo. <laughs> yeah, I can't give away all of our secrets, you know, because <laughs> I know for a fact that their head coach right now was my libero while I was there, and so I'm pretty sure they still call that same play Jiba. So. I'm not going to give that away. (laughs) But so, yeah, this holistically, I think this really, um, this really covers a a great deal, uh, you know, high level and, and more in depth of what this does for you and, and let it be known. Dustin said, it's almost guaranteed. No, he said it is guaranteed. (laughs) And one, one of the things that I love about this is things like this, where, you know, I get to talk with people I work with and they tell me the outcomes that they do get from this. One of the best was this girl that I just mentioned to you that was in high school and at state championships. She went in and I'll finish that story. You know, she went in uh, to the match against the number one team in the state. And we readjusted after she told me what happened. And I noticed what happened when her coach yelled at her. And we worked through it and we gave her the trigger whenever she felt that way. And boom, the entire match. She just was bombs away. I was so proud of her. Like she got blocked once, blocked bad. Like they roofed her. Boom. She just kept flying. She was the bald eagle that is. She just kept flying high. She wasn't scared. She was free to be herself. Nothing mattered but that one play. It's amazing to watch. It is absolutely amazing. And the best part about that was her mom. I talked to her mom weeks later and she said, Josh, it's not even what happened on the court with her. It's what's happening off the court with her. Her ability to manage her emotions as a young teenage girl now have just skyrocketed. And that's worth more than any of the volleyball to me. And I was like, whoa. And it was just really cool. Like, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe she said that. And uh, to me, like, that's, I mean, I get emotional, man. I'm an emotional person. But, like, <laughs> like seeing a young girl that I started working with and just that lack of confidence, and the, you know, just to think that I – in some way, maybe gave her a tool to have a better marriage someday, to have better relationships with herself. Like, I, it just fuels me, man. It's just so amazing to see that and to see how this affects every part of life when, when you use these processes with the game ready. 
I've always been fascinated with sports psychology and, you know, Dustin talked about Phil Jackson and I feel like for a lot of people, including myself, it's always been this very esoteric out there, intangible, spiritual, whatever you want to call it. And I think one thing that's great, great about the game ready is how tangible it is, right? We're achieving intangible goals, right? Things with our thoughts, mental patterns, uh, emotional patterns, through tangible ways. And I think that's what's so great and accessible about uh, your approach to this aspect of, or this method of sports psychology. So I really, really appreciate it. I mean, even me listening to this kind of gives me some things to think about and how I can improve my game and how to empower the girls that I coach to, you know, think about triggers and, and, and the mental preparation and, and make it tangible for them. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I'd be happy to do a game ready for you, you know, before your next competition, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, do something with you there. Um, also, you know, for anybody who's interested in the game ready, you can go to our website, vbmindsetter.com and you can read up more about it and you can purchase it there. I will say for, all of your viewers, Dust, for, for Dustin, you, you share this. Donnie, you share this. Um, I'm going to put a, a, a separate link down in, in here that you guys can put in, in your bio that will give like just an insane like a 50% discount nice. off it. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's amazing. You'll be able to essentially take me, you know, and our game readies to every practice if you want, to every match, you know, it's all, it'll be all right there in a portal for you to access all these recordings of me walking you through these game readies based on your position and based on how you're feeling. And then as well, I should add this, I wanna add something cooler even, for the first 10 people that were to <laughs> sign up, I will offer to do a free live game ready with them for their first game ready so man. so Jeff, you guys heard it man that's that's incredible i mean just talking with him personally has been really inspiring and 50 percent off so i really appreciate uh the hookup absolutely man yeah it's been a, it's been awesome to be here with you and and um and uh even greater right we have that connection with with my brother uh yeah. you know so it's been it's been good man it's it's good stuff so if you guys want to follow Dustin, he's got a pretty fun Instagram and very educational uh, if you want to learn about the vegan lifestyle, right? But yeah. also uh, the no easy buckets mindset. He's got his own thing going. I may or may not be coming out with a mindfulness journey, journal this week. Okay. So okay. definitely when that hypothetically if it comes out, you'll definitely see that on my uh, Instagram feed. But I think... Uh, going along with like kind of the toolbox. It's just like, you know, how for people, it's like, how can I be my best? How can I find that intention? So been working on something for a while. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens later this week. But uh, if anyone has questions about um, Josh's work, um, I think people that follow me know that I respond to every DM. <laughs> Cause uh, I want to help. I want to help other people because when I was younger, I was really passionate and I wasn't that, good you know I was like the second libero on my team even at Long Beach I was a walk on and so I'm always happy to help people and Josh has done a lot of the work in the summer you know just building a relationship with me and so I'm very grateful for the mentorship and friendship we have and, and it works <laughs> and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't people recognize that um, I like to keep it real very honest so if you want to reach out to me have questions happy to answer and uh, talk about my experience more personally. And uh, also, if you want to learn more about Dustin's story and the, I call him the walk on, um, you can check out the link to our original episode for, of the dig where he talks in depth about kind of his upbringing, his journey to his success right now. And a special thanks to, to Josh for being on this video. Uh, once again, his website, all the links will be in the description box. Uh, you can always follow me. Um, uh, on Instagram as well. And, and my handle is just VB mindsetter. And Donnie, we got to give a, uh, come down to SoCal or 
I'll make a move up there. But this summer, man, we gotta get pho and have a nice conversation in person, please. For sure. There's a, yeah. there's a really good pho spot right by our train center. So oh. I got you guys my treat, please. Thank you. Well, cool. Thanks, man. Right, well, Thanks again for having me. This has been fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks again for taking your time, guys. And uh, I know this is going to help a lot of people. So, Donnie, if you want, we can chat again. If, like, maybe, like, again, I want to provide value to the next generation. So if maybe there's, like, a, a big theme that people would be interested in me talking on, if you wanted to reconnect, we can go, like, in some other areas about volleyball, technical drills, mindset, mindfulness, whatever. If there's some way I can provide value and, like, there's of a lot course. of people. I'm always happy speaking with you. Have any ideas or there's something where they want to learn more, just write in the comments and yeah. go from there. Sounds good. I appreciate the offer. I think it would be sick if we did have pho. That's when we got We got to record our conversation when we're eating. Yeah. <laughs> that would be dope. Because that would be maybe one or two pho's, So. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, we got to stop this because now I'm thinking about fun. I live in Poland, which is possible. <laughs> you can't get that. No, <laughs> All right, well, thanks again, guys. Awesome, um, man. Been awesome. All right, okay. take care. All right, guys, see you later.